I call the meeting to order at uh, 9 11. Marsha, you want to call it? You have a little bit? Sorry. Present. Present. Uh, Emily Hill. She should be absent. Okay. Dennis Coleman's going to be absent. Doris Lassiter. Here. Thank you. Um, Beth Martz. Here. Um, excuse me. Matt Morey. Absent. Antonio Paisano. He's coming in a few minutes later. Okay. Uh, Marshall Robinson here. Karen Ruggles here. Thank you. Um, John White. Present. Virginia Woodrow here. And John McGrath. Present. The Harvest President. We have eight. Okay. Louis, you want to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance for your last official board act? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Lewis, it's your chance to give us some concerns and introduce your new successor, your new student body president. Here we go. Hello. Um, good morning. It's Saturday, 25th. Um, happy birthday. Um, I'm Louise. This is my last name. Okay, it's been so nice to be here with you all. And I'm going to give my last report. Okay, so we had graduation. It was like a few weeks ago, actually. It was so cute. Um, a lot of people cried. I did it. I wanted to, though. Um, grad night was also a really big success. A big success. I I heard a lot of students go home like at three and they woke up like at three the next day. So that was fun for them. Um, students for the most part are seniors have been able to transfer their student email. So thank you for that information. I was able to successfully transfer that information. So I have to look back at all my late assignments that I submitted that are not even better. But yeah, it's a good memory. Thank you. Uh, we had our senior awards night that day before graduation. I'm very thankful for all the awards I was chosen to receive. And I think the same goes for all students. Um, this school is very unique in all that it provides for its students. So I'd like to again thank everyone who helped make that possible. In terms of student concerns, I'm going to say it again. Um, I need this, we need to have this update or some kind of action taken for gender neutral restaurants on campus. We have increased the amount of bathrooms in general because there is very little. During the passing period, if you go inside a bathroom, there's no guarantee that you can be able to use it. So you just wasted your time that you could have been using to just go to class or you're gonna be late. And we already have like that strict policy on late on late. So so yeah, I feel like if we could help pinpoint whatever that issue is from like being late, then let's pinpoint. Let's figure it out and find an issue to it. And then for bathroom maintenance, there's I was actually talking to Annalie right now. I think it's Annalie. Yeah, it's yeah, Annalie. Uh, and I was just asking her, like, oh, like, how's the bathroom's been? And she's like, oh, yeah, they're pretty much the same. Like, they're definitely cleaner, so yay for that. Uh, but the stalls in there were still pretty faulty, like, there's like that lack of privacy in there. Like, imagine you're using the bathroom and someone put <coughs> you. That's not nice. But that's pretty much it. I would like to talk about having a comprehensive sexual education class in the curriculum for our students, or juniors and seniors especially, so it'll help them make more informed decisions about their sexual health. 
personally, I don't recall having a certain class section about this topic since my freshman year. And then again, that was like a small little week in or just single class that I had in my health class. It wasn't really, didn't really take anything away from it. There's just some things that are not common sense to a lot of students. So touching base on what that is through a comprehensive <laughs> sex ed class would be a priority to me at least. And then one last thing, there is vegans, vegetarians on this campus, and I'm sure they want to eat too, so we need to have a larger variety of food options for them. That's the last thing, I'm just kidding. Um, I want to thank everyone here, uh, all staff members who worked to resolve the issues that our students and staff raised. And again, thank you for the staff members who are making learning more enjoyable. Thank you for the continuous work that happens in the background to keep our school functioning. And as time goes on, I know it's gonna, still gonna be as important to get the input of our students and our staff to help make decisions that will improve the quality of our educational environment. But regardless, thank you for giving me the opportunity to voice the concerns of the student body. Um, today with me to my left, I have my successor, Ms. Adelie Rivera. And I'd like to introduce yourself. My name is Andrew Rivera, um, and I'm going to be my favorite president. <laughs> so I just wanted to come and say hi to all of you. I am very grateful for this opportunity, and I'm so excited to work with all of you on making next year very successful and comfortable, and comfortable for not only um, you guys, but also the students as well. Um, so I'm so excited, and thank you. Thank you. One year of keeping us what's going on with students. And good luck at UCLA. Whoa! I think <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right. Open communication, Chris. Chris, I'm sorry, Chris. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tris Carpenter. Uh, I am the consultant you that works. Here. Use the mic. Sure. Let's try. Hello. Hello. My name is Tris Carpenter. Um, some of you may recognize me from spending at least two and a half, maybe more years than, than since I've been in this room. Um, I am now a consultant working with the uh, Classified Employee Union. I'm here to give a quick report on that. Um, and you'll find out, you'll realize in a second why. Uh, Jose Reyes uh, resigned from being president the other day. Um, so he's not here to give a report. Um, I'm, I don't have much of a report to give. I just simply came to say, mostly um, and publicly, to thank him for the time and effort that he put in and the, and the work that he did to, to help his fellow uh, classified employees at, with the union. Um, and beyond that, I also wanted to recognize, because I don't know that it was ever recognized, that uh, Teresa Palmer, had, who was the secretary of the union for uh, many years, had retired uh, in, back in January and uh, wanted to make sure that uh, we made sure to publicly thank her as well. So with that, on to your meeting. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, uh, UGLA. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Richard DeFranzo reporting for uh, UTLA here at Birmingham Community Charter High School. Uh, first, I'd like to give a shout out to you, Luis. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I don't think we've had a uh, student rep show up so consistently, and uh, that's the truth, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, high expectations. <laughs> uh, much appreciated. Uh, so uh, i just got a few items to go through here. Uh, to close out the school year, we had some final confirmation votes. Uh, we have uh, coaches for subject matter, and that would include math, science, and now English. Um, there's confirmations that occurred, and as well as one instructional coach. Uh, historically, we've had two. This next year, we're going to have one. Um, uh, it, we also, uh, I guess I should update you on this, it, these uh, have been mentioned before, and at least with the uh, independent study, 
coordinator, you'll see that as action item number six, but there are two new full-time out-of-classroom positions at an activities director as well as uh, independent study coordinator. Um, the independent study for uh, credit recovery and whatnot here at Birmingham. Uh, one other thing, I, a few other things I have here, but one is uh, the next year's calendar. I noticed that uh, their calendar is uh, action item number 11 uh, for your purview, uh, much appreciated there. Uh, we are uh, thinking about, uh, that is uh, UTLA and the, the teachers, uh, about the 34 days that uh, we use for professional development. Um, it has been decided whether those are going to still be on Tuesdays or if they're going to migrate to Wednesdays. Um, and there's also time allocated uh, for different groups. Uh, we've agreed that well, one meeting a month would be for departments. And then in each semester, there are two uh, UTLA meetings. Those need to be placed. Uh, I think with, when we get the calendar, I'll be able to articulate more on that. Uh, another item that I wanted to uh, harp on a little bit here in, in relation to our teachers and, and those that, that support the teachers here at this school in the classroom. Um, this is going to be the fourth year of modifications to instruction for teachers. Um, look, in 2020, uh, we had COVID in March. That was just a big upheaval, right? Uh, adaptation, adaptation as best you could just to get through for, for everyone. 2020-21, uh, uh, we were remote. That was complete modification to ev everything in relation to uh, pacing plans, lesson plans, learning structures, classroom uh, interaction online. Um, and then 2021-22, we returned to the classroom, everything changed again. Uh, new PC plans, you've got this hyper integration of technology that is now embedded in, in our learning process. Uh, that changed uh, the classroom environment. It's just so different. It's one of these things that I'm really concerned about in relation to evaluations, is that many of our evaluators have not been in this new environment uh, that has been evolving and changing at such an accelerated rate. Uh, I'm just worried about whether or not uh, people will actually be in touch with where we are here and now. Um, and now in 2022-23, uh, we have a new academy period, which most likely is going to be embedded on Wednesdays, uh, probably an hour long. Um, now, that's going to put pressure on shorter classes for those days. That's another modification to pacing plans. Um, the impact there, um, not only is the shorter time for classes on those days, but now you have less instructional time. So that's a, another modification. So that's four years that are, I'm gonna park back on this over and over for the next number of board meetings as we move into reopeners. Um, that's a lot. We've asked a lot of our teachers. And I think some of this is, is becomes clear, the pressure, the stress, the, the exhaustion. We have very few sign up for summer school this year. We have a lot of vacancies. And that, I think, is a result of a lot of these changes. And uh, I know a number of our teachers, me included, are getting ready for next year. And uh, the, the school has provided the opportunity for extra duty hours uh, to prepare for next year, and that's much appreciated. Um, but this is, uh, there is just a lot, of, so much effort that has gone into uh, keeping this train going. Four years. Sometimes I really do feel like we're just working, working more for less. Um, Trial teachers, uh, it looks like, that it, in the sense that some of that's going to be mitigated, maybe down to two. Uh, at least one has uh, agreed to the uh, uh, movement. Uh, another another thing I'd like to see, and this came up from uh, actually one of our board members, Anthony here, Mr. Uh, this this past week, I was in an interviews with him, a flowchart for uh, duties of the 
administrators and everyone here at school, I guess, uh, especially the, uh, the, the top end there. Uh, health and welfare, uh, the, it's got to be one of our biggest concerns, right? I've been talking about this since January. Uh, some of the problems that we've seen have been mitigated, uh, but the whole process is very cumbersome for many people. It's not going to the doctor and just give them your card. You, you hope to get a doctor's appointment, you hope they clear your insurance, um, and then you've got to justify with the insurance company um, what, what has been done. And I noticed Yesterday, I was looking at the uh, explanation of benefits sent to me um, by BRMS, the RMS, and it, it referenced Fulton. And the, uh, I know that our insurance is being charged for test. Fulton is the one that does our COVID testing here. And they're, they're being charged, but there's a charge appears on, on my explanation of benefits um, for January, this is June 9th, plus, do you believe, um, $8. Uh, my understanding was that the federal government is going to pay for this and, and whatnot. Um, my assumption is that Birmingham and will, uh, will be able to sort that out and, and be able to pick up some of these uh, seemingly uh, Extra extra costs or charges. Uh, it's very difficult to follow the BMR MS explanation of benefits. And if you're looking for uh, a rebate, you, or, or if you if you go in and you have a service done, uh, you pay up front, and then you have to fill out the paperwork to get reimbursement. Like that's our process now. It's it's we manage our own healthcare. Thanks. Uh, Tardy policy. Uh, this is a Another issue I know that is at the forefront of some of our minds. Um, I, I can't, couldn't get into my classroom because they're cleaning, deep de cleaning the floors and, and whatnot. But I, I literally have a stack of tardy passes that I can barely wrap my, my little hand around. Um, in that stack, there's a student with 99 tardies. 99. Graduated here from Birmingham. Uh, I, do I have an answer for consequences for tardies? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but what, what we've been doing, uh, handing out slips, has not been successful. Um, there need to be consequences. We have very few consequences at the school. Uh, we have a lot more celebrations than we do uh, have discipline in, in many areas. Uh, I guess maybe my personal suggestion might be it, I, a lot like Granada is doing, uh, you tardy, you were, des you were shot to a designated tardy room. And uh, as those are tracked and, and, and whatnot, there are uh, consequences that go along with them. Look, uh, we made it through a pretty difficult year here. Um, there are a lot of things that happened from the beginning to the end of this year. We're on the precipice of a, a possible strike back in December. Uh, we came to an agreement. Um, we've got a good, a decent uh, structure going into uh, to next year. We've had lots of support systems for students. It's, it's a positive. Uh, we've got these uh, additional instructional uh, subject matter coaches, um, a lot of full-time coordinators. You're a student at this school, you've got 10 sets of eyes on you, um, you know, that, that can only be a benefit. And uh, that being said, uh, thank you very much for your time, and I uh, hope you all enjoy your summer. Thank you, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> informational items. <clears throat> we have two board members who are leaving. Um, first, and Emily is not here, but Emily Hill for her service as the parent representative. And Louis Macias, this is for you, for your service to Birmingham. 
Congratulations. Put that on your wall and your door. And if there's a committee that's going to inspect your dorm room, then that better be on the wall. Okay. Bob Marks. Good morning. Uh, I want to give an update on the uh, 2022 board elections. Um, months ago, we completed the certificated uh, process. Thank you, Matt. We have, uh, two incumbents were re-elected. Uh, Dennis Coleman and Matt Mowry. So certificate has been taken care of. Non-certificated, which is classified, uh, there, was, there were no candidates. Nobody put in their name to serve or to uh, uh, want to run for the position. Now, as you know, Jose is retired, or not retired, but resigned. Reyes. So I spoke with Angie, and she's going to put another uh, feeler out to the classified. Once everyone returns, so we'll have an election when everyone's in tech. Not all the classified are here uh, for the <coughs> summer. But they'll be here in a few weeks, probably in a month. So we'll try to conduct an election. We haven't had a classified rep in over a year. So that's something that uh, we probably need to look at and see if we can get somebody to uh, step forward. Uh, the parent rep, once again, we put out flyers again, but nobody bid on it. So uh, we'll put it again, put it out in July. Hopefully, we'll get somebody by our next meeting, which is the end of July. So, once again, Angie is pretty good at getting out and, and so forth. Now, the community reps we put out a flyer, also, and uh, the only people that are interested serving on the community are our five incumbents. So uh, Robert Alexander, <laughs> Michael Bennett, Doris Lassiter, Antonio Pisano, and Marsha Leibin. Hopefully they still feel they want to continue on the board. So we just need to uh, make a proclamation. Uh, You're making a motion? I make a motion? Yes. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion by uh, acclamation or vote that the five incumbent community members whose term ends next week be re-elected to two-year terms starting July 1st, 2022. Okay. Is so it moved in a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, we, should, we should actually should move it to an action item, right? All right, we'll move it to an action item. All right, thank you. Independent study program, Isaac. Morning. I was gonna show my slide, but it's very brief, so it's gonna be okay. Um, it's just a timeline. Uh, we gave you information last board meeting um, about the independent study program. You should have the independent study coordinator uh, job duties and responsibilities in your Dropbox. Um, if you don't have it in your Dropbox, then I also have, we also have extra copies here. Um, the independent study program we, is gonna launch on July 1st. Um, in the virtual lottery, as a lottery, as you all know, we're already at capacity, so we have to have a lottery for this program as well. Uh, the virtual lottery is going to be July 26th, and uh, once the lottery happens, the parent student orientation is July 28th, and the enrollment deadlines for students and parents is August 2nd and 3rd, and they will start school. Uh, like the rest of the school uh, on August 8th. So that's the brief uh, timeline for the independent study program. We're starting small with 25 students um, and to learn about the program, learn what we need to change. And then next school year, we'll expand 
uh, hopefully to 75 or 100 students. Uh, the curriculum that's adopted is A through G approved already. It is not NCAA approved because things are never NCAA approved when they start. We actually, there's a process for approval um, and that usually takes about a year to get um, anything approved, program courses approved. So that's gonna happen uh, sometime in November when they open the window. Or if we have a student who completes a course, then that actually uh, speeds up the process. Um, do you have any questions? How are the students uh, selected? Um, we're gonna open the window online. Um, and also it's gonna be referral, like if counselors know of students that would benefit from this program. Um, we're also gonna send a message to our, our current students and parents, informing them of this uh, program. But remember, it's only 25 kids. So um, I do believe we're gonna reach capacity by July 22nd. I already have parents calling, uh, letting me know to make sure to let them know as soon as this opens so they can apply for this program. Yes. Morning. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, is it remote learning? It is remote learning. So we are complying with AB 130, which now allows students to complete um, courses online, they do not have to be on campus if that's the question. Uh, they have the option to come on campus for support, um, but they don't have to be. Uh, so they will be uh, connecting with the coordinator twice per week to comply with the board policy that was approved at AB 130. So, so the, uh, the coordinator is in fact the teacher, are they one and the same for the first go around? Correct. So the, for the first year, the coordinator and the teacher are going to be the same. And they're going to carry the 25 students. I heard Mike ask about the recruiter, but um, what, what's the um, sales pitch, I guess is the word. What What are you saying so that students might want to do yes. that? I'm not asking it well, but. No, no, I understand. Um, so one thing that we're getting vetted by the attorneys now is to provide opportunities for students that not only are not successful in a traditional uh, setting, or it's not necessarily for career recovery, but it's mainly for students who can't have instruction in a traditional high school. So uh, we wanna get priority for students who have high anxiety, uh, medical high anxiety. They cannot be um, in a traditional large school, or we wanna give priority to students who are in the entertainment industry, and they're constantly have to be gone um, or students who belong to an athletic program that they can't be on campus. That's the priority uh, for the students. Um, we visited um, El Camino's independent study program um, and they are, they are doing something similar, but it's very far away. So for us to be sending our kids to El Camino to support them, might as well have a program for ourselves, for our students. And is there a pathway for them? So this will be a four-year program eventually. Yes. Is there a pathway for them to transition to the homeschool or whatever you want to call it? Yes, uh, that's yeah, that's a great question. We're actually clarifying that with the application. Uh, students who get admitted to our independent study program through the lottery have access to our uh, school if they are not successful. Because as you know, independent study is very complicated. So there are triggers that happen along the way if they're not being successful, that we have to allow them access to the traditional um, instructional setting. And it's yeah. like sports, right? right yes, there? yes. Okay, sports and, and drama and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, uh, students that are in, so the question is, can they compete in sports and drama? Yes, students in the independent study can compete and participate in our extracurricular activities. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Sort of an ABA question. Yes. Uh, I was waiting like, for that one. Do we have like a number of students in the Birmingham community, it's in the Valley uh, who go to other independent study programs that were losing that ABA as opposed to having this program expand to keep them within the uh, Birmingham or the I don't know the exact number because they're generally pass-throughs when they come to our school and that's uh, those are students that decide to go somewhere else because they don't want to be in a large comprehensive high school. Uh, but I can try to find that number for you for the next board meeting, but I can assure you that we have those numbers. 
And I can assure you that this school year, I've had at least almost like 10 parents now asking about independent study because they don't want their kids to go to a traditional large grant school. And we've had kids that have tried to get into City of Angels as an option. Um, but remember, we're always, because we're charter, we don't have priority there. Uh, so there's all these issues. I don't feel we're gonna have a problem filling the 25 uh, slots that we have for this coming school. Yeah. Yes. Antonio? Is it just to clarify, um, independent study is strictly a volume here don't push correct yes independent study has to be a parent student decision it could be a recommendation but it's not um, involuntary it's it's their choice so it's, a soft recommendation. Yeah, no. uh, it's a regular recommendation the policy doesn't say it has to be a strong or soft it's just a recommendation if the counselor um, teachers, um, if there's an SSBT meeting where it's determined, you know, this is a viable option for a student because of what's going on in the classroom, they have medical issues, and the parent and the student are in agreement, then they can enroll in the program. Yeah. Marcia? What about special ed students? So when it comes to special ed students, it's tricky. Uh, the law states that special ed students cannot participate in independent study unless, unless the IEP team determines that it's a viable option for the student because it requires a lot of independent work. Um, and so unless the IEP team determines that it is a viable option, it's not allowed for special students. And that's why the IEP team has to, so the question is how do they get services if they're in the uh, independent study program? That is the reason when the IEP team convenes, they have to discuss what those services mean and if they are available in independent study. So that has to be discussed because it may not be viable. If, if we can support the student, then it's not a viable option for the students with disabilities. If yeah. services are provided, tutors, et cetera, that's a money issue. That comes out of our budget, I would assume. Yes, um, we did. Uh, we, we are accounted for that. Um, I'm glad you're talking. That has to do with ADA. Um, so we're projecting roughly 300, a uh, low volume, uh, $315,000 uh, for the 25 students that are incoming. And that's based on our what we get for ADA projected, which is about this year we got 92% of. Um, what we should get because of the uh, attendance issues. So we're under, we're um, budgeting below the 92%. Um, so, so based on that, that's how we're making our, um, that's what we're deciding how to support the program. How many tutors are we gonna have? How many tutors we can afford? Is the coordinator salary in that, in the, in the ADA that we're collecting? So everything that we have planned for the coming school year for the implementation, is within the budget of the ADA that we're going to be that we're, we're going to be collecting for the independent study program. Would you say that it's within the budget? Does that, that mean that you're making it? That you make money? Um, um, it's, we're going to have leftover, uh, a few, uh, maybe a few thousand dollars left over. I haven't computed the exact number. It's basically paying for itself. Watch. Correct. It, uh, it is paying for itself. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't help the school. So it is paying for itself, yes. And that's the projection based on our numbers, our attendance, how students, you know, that, that's how we came up with that number. Any other questions? Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Um, okay, so the, the next one, I'm actually gonna hand it off to uh, Will, because I want to give him something to do on his, <laughs> on his last day with us. Make sure he drinks in that shirt. Yes. No, no he, Will gets to keep that shirt. Sure. He earned it. Will is always going to be a patriot in our hearts and minds. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Good to see everyone. Um, this is just talking about, uh, we've talked about, you know, my departure and succession planning and transition. Um, we are going to, uh, the recommendation that you have on your board agenda is to uh, elevate the, or re-change re the position of senior financial analyst to fiscal manager um, for a number of reasons. One, um, to ease uh, the, the my, my departure and uh, 
the incoming uh, CBO will have a, a lieutenant who understands everything that works in this position. Um, it's very similar to all the other positions that are had at like Granada Hills and Palisades and El Camino, they have this position. Um, uh, there's a lot that's changing, obviously, independent study. We have, you know, uh, this year coming, you see, you know, almost $9 million in uh, federal funds. Uh, so the, our reporting requirements are being increased. Um, it also will allow us to be more intentional about uh, budgeting on the department level. Um, so the scope is greater. Um, this individual is, has also will also continue to be a participant in the collective bargaining negotiations, which is key for us um, because we have three collective bargaining units now. Um, and just forecasting um, and uh, managing uh, the you know AP functions, um, and uh, as we have uh, greater transactions, more is going on with uh, you know additional responsibilities uh, to put things in the classroom. So. Um, Definitely uh, believe this is kind of part of our succession plan for me. Um, it is definitely highly needed, um, just so we can have continuity um, and be aligned with all, all the other schools in our conversion. The, the position as it was before is a confidential it position. A confidential it position. remains a confidential yes. uh, position. It's not in a bargaining unit. And uh, as Will said, it's, you know, we need somebody who's going to take on the responsibility of being sort of the right hand of the lieutenant of the incoming CBO and help with the transition. And so that's that's why we're making this happen. Any other questions? What's the salary? Um, the salary is there. Um, starts ninety seven. Ninety seven three two nine. It's commensurate with the positions of uh, our HR manager as well uh, the salary schedule as well as the other schools. So the, the I think the salary schedule is in the Dropbox. Uh, it's it's uh, rated in at the MGR N or N, MGR nine uh, level, which is the same as our HR manager. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Can we report? Let's see. Curriculum and instruction is nothing to report. Human resources nothing. Facilities and operations. Matt. Good morning, all. Uh, Richard Franzo, uh, reporting for uh, facilities and operations. Uh, this morning we didn't have a quorum, uh, didn't even have a room in the meeting, uh, really. <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, and all of you out there on the interwebs. Uh, so I, I don't have much uh, report the, the way I traditionally do, but I do have some items because some of our uh, committee members did give me some information. So. Uh, I'll update you. I don't have anything on the cafeteria, uh, but with technology, uh, the labs, uh, two computer Mac labs, uh, computers are currently being replaced and uh, getting ready for uh, developing the management systems in regards to that. Uh, all classrooms are getting uh, new printers. Uh, seemingly only 10 classrooms are, are, are left with this. Uh, there's a migration of information uh, off of the OneDrive. I think uh, Luis uh, kind of alluded to this uh, information being uh, needed to be transferred for those who are, are have graduated or, or are leaving. Um, the class of 2026, uh, their Chromebook distribution will uh, start July 26th. Uh, this year, uh, seniors had to turn their, their Chromebooks in, and those Chromebooks are going to be distributed out to uh, uh, some classrooms to uh, to be reused as a as a resource there. Uh, the number of uh, issues regarding hardware and software. Most of the issues here uh, in regards to teachers uh, have been hardware. Uh, student tickets here have really really been minimized. So uh, near our textbook room, which is just behind some of you, in front of some of you, but just adjacent to us. Um, there we do have our technology room We're in our Chromebook distribution center and, and when students need help they can go in there exchange Chromebook uh, maybe get a PowerPoint. Uh, in my personal experience here it, it, it's been helpful to the students there uh, with no delay in instant action. Uh, in regards to uh, the facilities it, it, itself, um, right now we're going to 
think every year through the deep cleaning of classrooms and offices and that includes like waxing the floors, cleaning surfaces. Um, they're also working on the dance floor. Um, a, a large section of the dance floor has been replaced. Uh, the, dan the dance studio is just adjacent to the PA. They do the buildings, nice little room in there. Uh, and the chair uses it sometimes as well as the dance team. Um, and their uh, the maintenance team is working through a, a large list of uh, requests uh, currently. And then, uh, in, lastly, in regards to uh, capital projects, uh, I was discussing with Mr. Ari Bennett uh, this morning, uh, the, the ongoing project we have with uh, installing portable classrooms and portable facilities here on campus, uh, that mostly those are out near the, the 400s, uh, but we uh, had spoken to this issue, and Ari, if you would you want to share out a little bit that would be uh, great. Yeah, so we're working with um, a project management company, uh, CPM Partners, and uh, they're they're helping us uh, clean up the way we present the bids, and um, and so for for instance, uh, they've set up a uh, top crisp plan room, and that's the uh, it's a, the platform that they use to send out bids, and uh, and then. The uh, contractors will send all their information there, so there will be we won't be collecting bids here. For instance, it'll all, all happen online. Um, we expect to get the um, the bid should be ready on looking at my notes on July fifth. So we'll send it out again. Um, the crisp plan room has been set up. Um, set up uh, uh, the project to pre-notify safety pre-qualified contractors has already been done. Um, sent out a blast email notifying contractors of upcoming B BCCHS projects. Um, we're, uh, we're also in discovery for the power provider and electrical application because uh, the uh, DW LA DWP is ultimately has to um, work and develop the, the I guess, the uh, uh, electric uh, architectural plans. And so that goes through LEDWP, and so we've already reached out to them, and that's we're making progress. Um, we, we're looking at uh, vendor, four different vendors, to do uh, uh, the testing and inspection during the uh, uh, during the project. The project will be it, our timeline is October, and so that's when the DSA plans expire, and so we have to be like shovels up um, or shovels in by by that date, um, but. The, as I mentioned, the bid will be July 5th, and we should be able to get the project rolling by the uh, the end of August, September at the September at the latest. And uh, we're in a much better position right now uh, than we were when we originally put this out to bid, and it was just sort of Lionel, um, you know, me and Angie trying to figure out how to make it happen. CPM's really helped us a lot uh, streamline that process. We have a meeting with LAUSD. Um, uh, and uh, we're all on the we're all on the same page, and, and they're actually helping us uh, hopefully maximize the uh, uh, this project timeline by uh, offering some some good options. And one of them would be to uh, include the other two classrooms that were cut out of the project when we were not able to work with Magnolia. Uh, we may be able to put those in, uh, in another open space. Um, in the 400s, and so we want to, for this project, we want to maximize as many classrooms that will be installed as possible. I think that's the big idea. And so um, so they're being very helpful to us in managing um, the, managing how this project is going to come off and, and to make it really maximize resources that we have and uh, to get it in as many classrooms as we can. So it, it's, it's going pretty well at this point. Yeah. Will that give Magnolia more space? <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, well, one, of, one of the issues there, uh, Mr. White, was uh, we, we do have a, a small green space that could fit two portables, uh, but that was a point of contention with Magnolia. They did not they didn't want them in that proximity. Um, so that's where two had gotten cut out of the, of the process. As I'm standing here listening to you, Ari, 
Uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe we should, next meeting we should just have a, a, a big map up so that you know I can conceptualize all this in my head very well. Oh, yeah. Miss Witherroga, and I think probably remembers many aspects of the campus and knows what we're talking about. But uh, even those who, of us who have been here for a long time, uh, I mentioned a space near the softball field, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you, they don't, you know, spaces between 400s, how compressed is what's What is it going to look like? We're going to be losing parking spots. Where are they going to go? Um, yeah, I, that's something that I'll put, to, put together so that we can all get have a better sense of you know, what's, what's going on in this discussion that's been going on for so long. And I know in the past we've looked at maps, but we'll do, I'll do a better job with that. Uh, that's all I have as a facilities committee. Um, thank you very much. I would like to speak to the advisory finance committee. Uh, we were not able to meet. Uh, Ms. Security told me to uh, wish you all very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, student services. I don't see anybody here report. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Bennett. Okay. So, um, number one overview of the 2122 LAUSD Charter Oversight Report. That should be in your drop boxes. Um, we again were. Hi, right, guys. Um, and so we received uh, fours in governance and fours in finance like we did last year so that's like four years in a row yes so well done well done that's awesome and governance so that's part of that is the the board's role um for academics they gave us a, a no score um they weren't giving scores to any of the schools because the high stakes um assessments did not count last year and so um so that just got an na and then in um the organizational management programs and operations, we received a three. Now, last year in that, we received a four. So um, I, I set up a meeting with um, Luis uh, who, uh, Aguilar, who's our charter oversight um, coordinator, if you will. And um, we had a really good conversation and went through all the points. I think one of the, um, I think the best way to illustrate it is, and so I created a, a chart, um, that should be also be in the Dropbox, and it compares this year to last year. And one of the things that you'll notice is the our average score this year is actually better than it was last year. Um, and the way they the way they come up with the overall score is so. For instance, in 2021-22, um, we had 37 points, and so you receive a one, two, three, or four in all of the listed categories. You add those up and divide it, right? You get an average. And so um, this year, our average was 3.36. That gets um, rounded down to three. Um, interestingly enough, last year, our average was 3.33. And um, somehow they made a rounding error, is what I found out. So um, it wasn't that we did worse. We just sort of got a, a gift for um, last year um, with the you know mathematical challenges. That, that people may have. And so um, we did, um, in fact, in like health and safety training and preparation, we got a four this year, last year we got a three. Everything else was was the same. And so, um, you know, the, the other point that he made is subjective. You know, the other point he made is they consolidated a couple categories. So it's not necessarily fully apples to apples. Um, he sets up the report. He gives preliminary score and sends it off sort of upstairs to, you know, the higher ups and they make changes sometimes without maybe having all the information. And so I, I think the bottom line is um, we're still on track. Um, he gave me some tips on how we can um, increase some of those threes to a four um, that we'll take advantage of, um, of next year. You know, some of it is just, um, you know, doing um, focus groups with teachers on professional development, for, for example. And I think that's a great idea. That's something we can do and, and you know, hopefully show a, um, a commitment to get that that feedback. And so there are a lot, there are little things, but in general, we're in, we're in a good place. Threes and fours are good. So we got two fours and a three overall, and then an NA. And so um, now that I have a better understanding of what happened in this category, you know, in this area, 
organizational management. I, I feel okay about it, but any questions? What, did they uh, extend the time for renewal? Yeah, yeah, so, but that wasn't done, you know, that wasn't done by LAUSD. That was um, what part of, uh, I think that was part of AB 1505, actually, where they extended the, uh, they extended it two additional years. So it's instead of 2024, it's 2026. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay, any questions? Thank you. So that Thank was um, agenda. Okay, so next up is administrators. Yes, thank you. So um, I am. I, I didn't know that we were going to be able to do this, but we um, we actually were able to hire a CBO as well, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, so we have uh, first is our, our operations administrator Tommy Elmore. Um, he was an assistant principal at um, Cesar Chavez um, ACE. Uh, that was, that's the acronym for the school. It's based on scientific exploration. Um, but before that, he was, for seven years, was um, what's called in, in LAUSD parlance an SBOM, a school-based operations manager. And so, um, you know, we know um, how big the, the scope is of, um, you know, doing operations for the site. And so we wanted to bring in somebody that really had a lot of experience and focus in the operations area. There are not a lot of SBOMs in LAUSD. Um, the position was created. <laughs> Sorry, um, the operation managers. There are not a lot of operation managers in LAUSD, and um, and so basically, if you have um, a, a facility where there are four or five schools on the same campus, the operations manager is running the operations for all of the schools, right? And so they're, you know, they're needing to. Um, keep the peace between all of the principals. Um, you know, uh, there is a consolidated athletic program, a consolidated safety program. And so it's really good experience for the type of work that we want Tommy to come in and do. Um, he's already, you know, even though, you know, the assignment begins in July, he's already been coming in um, every day, meeting with people and, you know, reaching out to our CPM and, and uh, looking at our safety plan. So. I'm excited about his role and contribution here. Um, additionally, the other administrator is uh, Tadeo Climaco. Um, he's been a principal in LAUSD for about 10 years um, at pilot schools, well, at pilot schools um, downtown in Miguel Contreras, one of the pilot schools there. And then also um, he came to the Valley and he was the principal at Sun Valley High School and, um, was, and really was selected because of his leadership to um, for that school to be the conversion school of an enriched studies program in the Northeast Valley. And so, for example, everybody's heard of SOSIS, uh, Sherman Oak Center of Inward Studies, and LACES, Los Angeles Center of Inward Studies. Um, there's a new one in the South called MACES, um, Maywood Academy of um, you know, Enriched Sciences. And so, um, Sun Valley was converted into a school called BOSIS, um, Village Oaks Center for Enriched Studies. And so, he led that conversion, but now is is coming over to us in a different role. But he has a wealth of experience, um, just an awesome leader, a lot of experience working on uh, supporting high quality instruction and co-teaching, um, supporting the um, uh, you know building the capacity of, um, of teachers to support English learners. And so he'll be working a couple of the areas he'll be working on is with English learners and uh, and parents also. But so we're really excited to have him. And then finally, um, a new chief business officer, Christine Torres. And um, we were able to finalize that just uh, just yesterday. Uh, she comes, she was the director of finance and accounting from Las Virginia Unified. And um, we were we were lucky to find her. We actually interviewed uh, her colleague, who's the assistant superintendent, who ended up going to LACO. But um, Karen had been uh, mentoring uh, Christine for the last five years, and we're really excited to have her and her experience, and of course, I use the connection to LACO with the Chief Business Officer and Karen Kimmel. So, I, I, we're in a good place. Uh, you know, it's going to take us a while to get everybody up and running. Um, uh, the fiscal manager position is going to help. You know, nobody's going to replace um, that this dude right here. Um, but I know they've already talked. Christine and Will have already talked. And Will will continue to be a resource to help the transition. 
So um, th that's that's the update on the uh, the new administrators and the CEO. Yeah. Right. Yes. I'd appreciate for the board to hear you. Sure. Yeah, that's right. Right. yeah, yeah. that's fine. Um, I did talk to Christine. We had um, an introductory call with Ari and um, Amanda, um, and then I uh, had a follow-up call about probably about 60, 65 minutes. And you know, it was refreshing to me that she asked all the questions that I would have expected of a CBO candidate. Um, she, her breadth of knowledge, uh, she went through the CBO training program, so she understands how it works. Um, she actually had some experience that we were just learning about uh, working with LACO and the, what we call the best system, um, the system that uh, LACO was using now to do all the fiscal management for the, the school's account. So she implemented that for those versions. Um, her experience is broad beyond just school. She had some private industry experience as well. Um, she, you know, the other thing I was concerned about was like, you know, how do you develop people? I, I feel that I've invested a lot in this team, and I, I think she is the perfect person to hand the baton off to continue to grow the, the team. Um, I, I think uh, she's going to add tremendous value in terms of how we look at managing, uh, back to managing my resource or categorical programs. So that's kind of where this is going back to. Um, and, and just making sure that the board is, you know, clear on, the investments we're making in partnership with what Ari is doing with the uh, expansion of counseling, that she will be able to provide fiscal impact and say, okay, we've invested this much and then uh, the results are here. And just prepare us for when, as we uh, phase out of the, the CARES Act that we're, we're positioned. Um, she has actually experience in you know uh, projects in terms of like capital projects. So everything that we're doing, she's touched. So I'm confident in her ability. Yes. She was working for the district in that capacity, not at a particular school. Uh, yeah, right. she was at the district. Yeah. So her, her so she scope, was, scope, was, scope was the district. Yes. So she has experience yes. in all these. She things. has experience with district contacts at LACO. Um, you know, she she will definitely add value to the, the team. Yes, Marge? Mr. Bennett, it would be nice if we could meet all of these people. I would ask that you have them at our next board meeting. Please. I will definitely have them at the next board meeting. Thank you. We got them. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So next up, we have class of 2022 uh, preliminary graduation data. So I made a one-sheeter um, that's in your Dropbox. Looks kind of like this. Um, I know Isaac can talk to it also, but um, uh, the preliminary graduation rate was 97.8 percent. Um, I, I want to, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Cindy Puentes and Judith Nelsa, <coughs> senior counselors, Janina Franco, the senior coordinator. Um, it takes a, a team getting all these kids, especially, in the, you know, with the last two years or three years of COVID, um, getting these kids to the finish line. Um, I'm really proud of the work of the counselors and the entire team. And Isaac has been doing a fantastic job at setting the expectation that kids are going to complete and kids are going to complete university eligible. And so we continue to make progress there. 71% of the students, um, and this is preliminary, could end up a little bit higher, but 71% um, were eligible for university um, upon graduation. And for the first time in Birmingham's history, uh, over 50%, 50.1%, um, will be matriculating to a four-year university. And so um, I think that's just the beginning. I think it's going to go significantly higher. That's that's the direction that we're pushing. And it's not that, um, I mean, there are going to be kids that continue to go to community college and utilize that, especially as the systems to transfer from community college to university um, become more streamlined and the support is greater. Uh, we will continue to support that. And of course, we have students that are moving on to the armed forces and they're moving into the um, into the workforce. And so uh, the, the big idea in getting everybody or as many as we can to be university eligible is that those skills aren't just important for university, they're also important for um, their career path. And so we want to, you know, I'm proud of where we of where we are in supporting students to get there. And, I, you know, I have to say, again, you know, I sound like a broken record, but three years of COVID, um, our teachers did everything they could to give our kids multiple opportunities and really help them to get to the finish line. And so, um, you know, it's not just for the 
the struggling student that's trying to pass the class and get the C, but it's also for the kid, it's also for the A student that was struggling with a lot of stuff and maybe their grade dropped a little bit and they needed other opportunities to get to that A. And so, you know, I want to thank, um, you know, Karen and, um, you know, on behalf of the teachers and, and Matt, um, it's not, it, it hasn't been an easy lift and it has been expressed a lot. Um, it's been, there's been a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, it's been unsettling, just um, not knowing sort of what's gonna happen next with COVID. And um, everybody's kept it together and kept moving forward for kids. And these are the results. And I'm very proud of the work that, that everybody has done at Birmingham. I think, um, I don't know if board members have seen it, but in the main office, they had every graduate's picture up there. And they posted what college they were accepted to. So it's very, very powerful to see all those kids up there and kids looking at their name to make sure their, their college was posted. So congratulate. I think, who did that one? So, um, Jose Luis Navarro and, and his assistant, Larisala Lomeli. Um, that was set, a very good thing there. to do. Yeah. Um, I, I know we also had, had the kids' pictures posted on the marquee, but I'm not sure if the marquee is still operable. So that's a that's a separate issue. Um, anyway, really, really cool stuff. On that graduation percentage, will some of the students complete something when school resumes and that will entitle them to graduate? Yeah, so we I think we have two students on here that are um, enrolled in 22-23, so we're going to help them complete next year. And then we have a number of kids that are in, that are in summer school as well. Yeah. Isaac, do you have that, that number on the kids that can complete the summer? Well, we could end up 98 plus yes. Yes. graduation which is, yeah. yeah. Sorry. We need to share that. This may be a question. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know if it's you or it's for Isaac. Do we know um, of these 672 kids, do we know what the number was for that class as freshmen? Do, do we know like how many we lost along the way? Yeah. I mean, the two, what, two years from freshman to sophomore, sophomore yeah. to junior, junior. Right. Yeah, well, I, I would I would look at it like this. I mean, we usually try to start in ninth grade somewhere between 825 and 850. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought up that point because that's that's one of in, I think it was last year or the year before, and I'll, I'll have to share it again in the sort of the five year framework strategic plan that I presented to the, to the board. Um, one of the metrics is increasing the percentage of kids that start with us that complete with us, decreasing the percentage of kids that aren't going to make it, and and that we end up. They end up going to um, a continuation school, for instance. I want to decrease that number. I want more of those kids to be successful and be able to complete with us here. And the better we set up that foundation, the transition for, from eighth to ninth, um, stronger support system in ninth and tenth, I think more of those kids, more of the 850 are going to get to 12th grade. And um, and typically, that's what you want is you, you know, you sort of aspire to have, you know, at least at least 90% of the students, um, the size of the, of the 12th grade class is at least 90% of the freshman class. And so we're not quite there yet, but I think we're getting better every year. So you're thinking it was about eight something, 850, all hard yet, something? 815 somewhere. But I mean, I realize we lost, you know. <laughs> we well, we do have the pandemic, which yeah. probably accounts for a lot of that loss. Well, yeah, and so yeah, I mean that's like that's 150 kids approximately. Yeah, no, I know. Wow. So, um, but I'm glad you brought that up. That that is a point. That is, it's a data point that doesn't show up in high stakes data. So, it, you know, 98 percent or 97 percent looks great, and the A through G looks great, but um, it doesn't tell the whole story, right? And I think the whole story for us internally, it's important that us as leaders of the school are looking at that number. The number of kids that need to transfer out to continuation and we need to continue to address it and decrease that number so more kids can so we can have graduating classes over 800. But to really do a good analysis of that, we have to disaggregate, you know, in only include the kids that went to continuation, etc. and not the kids who just can't afford to live in Los Angeles anymore, that kind of move elsewhere, etc. Because 
There's, there's a lot of that. Yeah, and I, I, actually, I talked to Isaac about that. What can do about that? Yeah. You know, you can only do with what you, what you have the ability to, to deal with. Yeah, I think the number that we're focused on are the kids that transfer to continuation school. Yeah. Um, right. Right. And so that, that's the target for us, and um, you know, trying to decrease that number. We don't have large numbers of kids sitting in. Um, city of angels or, or something like that that just never came back but that are still being remotely taught or anything like that but that's not part of our numbers at all anymore right no okay got it okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. on the uh on the a through g requirements that are you all saying it's a good number i don't know where it is is there did, did we have a target that we need it do we have a desired target well, you know, kind of also sure. I mean, the goal with A through G is um, you want there to not be a gap between graduation rate and A through G. Um, you know, if we go back like seven or eight years, Birmingham's A through G was at like 20 or 30 percent. And so, um, you know, we're not done yet on, on this path. We're getting better and better and better. Students that are graduating but have not the kids are going to be to for your college. Do we know what they're up to? Are we capturing that data? Yeah. Is, it not, is there a way we can capture that data and also track that and see kind of what? Because that'll be telling to us as far as what kind of alternative resources we can provide to those students. Like, hey, there's trade tech colleges, there's other trades that can, you know, and we can start building relationships or pathways to maybe give them better opportunities. That I can tell you, most of my peers to this day, <coughs> high school buddies of mine, most of them go to college, and they're all homeowners with families, have they have businesses or something like that. So it'd be nice if we could just capture that kind of data and see if that they're doing something productive, or at least we're giving resources. Yeah, and so we track it with the senior survey, okay. and so it, it's self-reported. We have their contact information, um, so to the best of our ability, we'll continue to, to get to them. We had uh, I don't know if you guys remember, we had. Um, Rochelle Kronstadt in a um, in a in a cool um, piloted role as a um, sort of college persistence counselor, and so doing outreach with kids that just graduated to try to help them overcome the obstacles they would have. Um, she she's not really doing that in a formal way, but has agreed to continue to volunteer to do that for us. And um, you know, I think ultimately I want to have systems in place where all of our kids that graduate they know they can. We continue to be a system of support for them as they move forward. Um, the next thing on the agenda, um, I realized I, I was talking to um, to uh, Marsha Ryben last board meeting, and I realized uh, we may have not um, uh, shared this information as widely as we should. So um, I wanted to provide this this information sheet. Um, if you have, I only printed out the first page. If you see the document online. You'll see the entire article that, that Stanford wrote up. Um, Stanford did a report. We were included in it. A lot of our kids were profiled in it. And so there are, um, you'll see in the in the Dropbox, I mean, it's like a 10 or 12 page document with um, cool profiles and the kids talking about their experience. The bottom line is the, um, so what is the National um, Equity, National Education Equity Lab? It's actually something that um, has, was really big in Miami and I know now um, that superintendent um, Carballo is trying to bring to LAUSD. Um, I first heard about it from Lindsey Humphrey and um, got Isaac on board and Isaac and her and, and Ana Palacios have really pushed it. The big idea is this, right? And you see the quote at the top of the page, talent is evenly distributed, opportunity is not. The whole idea is our kids are just as capable as kids in upper middle class neighborhoods um, to have the potential to compete at the highest level academically. Um, and so the National Education Equity Lab connects schools like ours and top universities. Um, for instance, so we had two classes on our campus this year, um, from, one from Stanford and one from Princeton. Uh, the Stanford class, uh, CS 105, Intro to Computer Science, and then um, uh, from Princeton, Sociology 250, The Western Way of War. I believe we had like 36 kids um, in those classes. Um, you can see the data here, 93% passed with A's or B's. 
all of them had to see her better. And what they do is um, we're using the technology that now has become ubiquitous. And um, so they connect remotely with a professor from Stanford and Princeton in this case. And then Lindsay Humphrey is the in-classroom support provider, um, providing the kids that are here, obviously supervising, assisting them and helping them and, and making contact with the professor at the, at the university to make sure our kids have everything they need to be successful. But what an amazing opportunity our kids have really thrived um, as they have in, you know, as we provide that support, our kids really step up and, and it's cool. And so um, I'm not sure what which universities we're working with next year, Isaac. Um, it, I believe it's uh, Bowdoin and uh, Yale. Okay. For next year. So um, you know, I'll make sure that we're sharing out about that. It's um, you know, it's it's obviously free to the kids. There, this is like going to go on their transcript. I mean, what what an amazing opportunity, and our kids are really thriving with it. And so I wanted to make sure. You know that I want to make sure the community knows that um, because our kids here can compete at the highest level academically, and we want everybody to be aware of that. And we want um, you know high performers all over the city of LA to know Birmingham's a viable option for them too. Um, we have great academics, um, <coughs> great extracurricular opportunities, great performing arts, um, and as well as great athletic program. So cool stuff. Thank you. The, uh, all right, next up, we're, thank you, Matt, for mentioning the, the attendance policy. I mean, I agree with you on the direction we're going to go. I haven't, I put something out to the staff to get input on the policy. I haven't gotten a lot yet, so I didn't want to present anything. I want to give it, a, I'll give it um, another couple of weeks, two or three weeks to get more feedback on what a policy might look like. But um, yeah, we will have uh, consequences with teeth in it for kids that are not coming to school on time. Uh, during first or fifth period. So that's to come. And then finally, um, this is something I, I had mentioned in the past, um, and this is just for informational today, it's not an action item yet, but the idea is we are challenged when we have, when our teams, and we've got a lot of teams at the same time, um, like in winter and spring, that start to compete in, re, you know, Southern California regional and state playoffs. And the turnaround time to get board approval on all of those trips is a challenge. And so just for those, this policy um, authorizes, if the board approves, it authorizes me to approve it so it doesn't have to go to board. I've already reached out to our insurance carrier, um, Charter Safe. Safe. Yeah, Charter Safe, Charter Life. Charter Safe is our insurance carrier. I reached out to them to see if there is if there are any issues related to that. Uh, Jim Young, our, our attorney at YMC, recommended we do that. I did that. They, they don't see that as a problem. Um, they gave us some, you know, like field trip slips that they wanted to make sure that um, we incorporate into our process. So we have all the waivers and everything signed. But that's just normal um, sort of a release of liability when they go on field trips or overnight trips. So we'll incorporate that. And uh, hopefully this will just streamline the process and make it easier for us to make decisions. Next time. Right. Next time that's it. Not today. Uh, is there is there certain criteria? I assume the certain criteria we usually like it really gets presented to us when we approve those. Yeah, I mean it's well, what I what I would suggest just as one board member, because we're gonna delegate authority to be which I'm totally fine with. Um, just for CY purposes maybe you generate a half page kind of yeah, check this again. With you. So when you approve these acting in that capacity, yeah. you are certified that hey, it meets it meets board approved criteria. Yeah, just as a as an extra <laughs> control measure. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. So maybe I can back it to maybe that can be like an event. I can yeah, I can add, actually add that to this also for the action item for next time. No, no, but it should be added, yeah. That's, that's that's what we're next week. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, that way you can add. Is that, is that how it is? Okay. 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 Cool. Um, before you go on, Matt, and you mentioned the tardies and so forth and all consequences. Was there a comparison made between pandemic and pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, or was it 
pretty much the same because the pandemic just gave a lot of students opportunity not to participate at all. So it may have skewed the, the data that we have. So we want to make sure that we're comparing it with what happened before, what happened during the sure. pandemic. So my first year at Birmingham, I noticed, um, you know, how many, it, it's, it almost seemed like we were an open campus when I first got here, um, with the amount of kids that would come in late. And so we implemented, uh, brought in some technology, implemented the Tardy Sweep program. It worked really well for the other periods <laughs> during the day, once the kids are here, but it's still, we still have much higher numbers, periods one and five. Yeah, first and five. Um, and then we shut down, right? And so we're, we're playing with it, you know, in terms of what we can do, period one and five. We did, um, the biggest thing that we did at, at that time was very soon after their tardy, then they would get picked up for lunch, uh, for lunch detention, right? And that's the biggest sort of, one of the biggest penalties for them is to not eat lunch with their friends. So that was, that was fairly effective, but still not where we wanted it to be. And then we and then we shut down. Um, and when we opened up again, it was uh, yeah. I mean, we've been challenged because we couldn't implement the like a, a lunchtime detention like we used to under COVID protocols. So we couldn't put you know a hundred kids in here with lunch while we still were requiring masks and we had protocols for how far you know how far away they had to be. To eat for to take off their mask, so we didn't have some of the those tools that would have helped us to address those numbers in a better way, and so it became, you know, kids just push the system, and there was um you know a certain capacity that our deans had to get everything done um, in terms of the detentions, holding kids accountable. At the same time, that we're also having increased. Discipline problems school wide, and you know, dr drugs or you know, weapons, etc. Because that was happening in every school um, after the pandemic, and so um, we did the best we could. I, I think next year, obviously, as we start the year, we're going to be a lot clearer about the expectations. We're not worried as much about what does bringing them back to campus for the first time look like, feel like for them, which was a big um, focus for us last year. So this year it'll be different, and we hope we'll have the systems in place that will let students know that they need to be in class <laughs> the first or fifth period on time, or else they're not going to be able to pass that class. The well, first period of targets, not an excuse for them because I mean they don't have time to start and stuff like that. But I know sometimes when I'm trying to get here, the traffic is horrendous. I mean, oh, yeah. It may take me 10, 15 minutes yeah, right on the corner to get to get to get in. So are some of the reasons why that they would be here on time? But it's it's nine reasons why they're not. Without excuse, I mean, I know yeah. I'm here and I, I can see a lot earlier and stuff like that. Yeah. But still, maybe that's a side cause that we have to address to try to alleviate some of the problem. It, it is. I think I think that's right. But um, like I tested different theories. Like I tested theories. Like um, some of one of the things I heard in the beginning was there weren't as many buses, so kids couldn't get the the bus on the you know, on time or wouldn't come. Um, some said it was traffic, but it's right. But but then you have a kid right next to that kid who has those same obstacles, but it manages to get there on time. And so um, I do think it's about how we held them accountable, and um, and when they didn't really see that there were big consequences, then they took advantage of it. I, I, being here for six years, I. Been here before pandemic. Tardies are always an issue. It, it wasn't them kind of knowing now, oh, I'm going to be late. This has been an issue way before then. Um, I just recently moved to Reseda, but I lived in Pasadena and came here. So when somebody says I'm late because of traffic, I don't have sympathy for that. Thank I'm you. making sure I'm at work on time. Um, I'm getting it from summer school. And I, you know, why are you walking in for 40 minutes late? My grandmother. I don't know how old are you? I'm 16. Why do you want to be grandmother? Um, and it, well, it's the bus. 
Okay, take an earlier bus. Like, so whatever is being thrown is still not an excuse. Exactly. So you throw it and hope it sticks is not, is, we're not telling him it's not acceptable. Find another, because when you get out there and you have to be at your job, what do you get to say? Yeah. You're lost. Doris, I'm going to threaten and bring that to that. <laughs> Not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Not in our lifetime. <laughs> so we are going to be initially challenged because um, some of our surrounding schools that had started at 8 o'clock will now be starting at 8.30, same time as Birmingham. So um, now I have, um, we had a new school police officer last year that was really fantastic, Tom Clements. Um, he's been a great partner with us. And um, I tasked him and uh, Tommy Elmore, the new admin charge of ops, and, and Mike Serrano, our campus safety manager, to put together a plan for um, next school year for pickoff and drop off on both sides. So we can at least streamline how that works. Um, you know, get sort of ingress and egress out. Um, so at least we can make it a little more efficient. We don't, you know, we, we and then we'll have to adapt to what it looks like. Uh, we don't know what it, you know, we won't know what it looks like. Everybody's starting at 8.30 until we see it. Uh, but we'll certainly have a better plan in place and, and make adjustments as we go. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just give you one simple, one, one example of a, a simple switch. If you go into, um, a lot of parents drop off in the student lot, in the student parking lot on Haynes, right? And so, the way it has been historically, and it was this way when I went here, um, you go in through the student parking lot in Haynes, through the entrance, right? And then people go out the same way. And that creates a log jam right there. And so we're not going to allow that anymore at pick off and drop off time. They're gonna have to go all the way and then out through the softball field parking lot. And then out to the service road and then they can go out to Bubbo. Um, that's to improve flow. So people aren't stopping and then turn, making you turn in the parking lot and then going back and then stopping cars from going in. That's one example. Um, we also have signs that uh, we've are already purchased, no U-turns, because um, that's another thing that slows up traffic movement on Haynes. Um, parents come in, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll like push the kid out of the car while they're driving and then they want to make a quick U-turn and go right back out to Balboa and so we'll have no U-turn signs, you know, we're going to know, you know, I'm going to need administrators out there, um, a lot of school police out there, not giving, not ticketing, but trying to set the expectation of what sort of the, the uh, you know, the, the protocol is. So we're hoping that that'll have a positive impact and, uh, you know, we'll make adjustments as we go. So how are the parents going to know before school starts? That's the new... Yeah, once we have a plan, we're going to inundate them with information. Before school starts. Before school starts. It's an infographic. Yeah. The, the whole plan. Sorry. The plan, though, is complex wise from Pearl to Mall Holland to High Tech Mall. to Magnolia. To, I mean, it's. Independence. Because this whole thing, as you well know, with Victory and Melboa to Magnolia yeah. is like. Yeah, so our school police everybody. officer is, you know is connected with all those other schools. And so he's trying to set up a meeting for the entire complex. So we can talk through that. Um, you know, we've already met with Magnolia and High Tech LA about things that we need to be prepared for. We um, agreed that we were gonna meet again in like late July to um, confirm plans we have. So at least those three schools will be on the same page. So, um, yeah, we're going to do everything we can to make it a little bit better. Okay. Well, okay. all right. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I do want to um, thank the, uh, the entire business office team and the HR team uh, for uh, the work that they did on what we saw report. Um, you know, four fours is a hard accomplishment, um, but it takes a team to do that. And uh, we would have not achieved that without the the hard work, diligence, and focus, and long days of uh, providing support to our, our oversight people. So, um, the team that you guys have between those two departments are strong. Um, I am happy 
to and out of uh, been their leader. Um, and I just want to thank them publicly for all the work that they've done. Um, on to business. Uh, oh, I guess what I mean. um, Secondly, uh, it has it has been an honor to serve this organization, this board, uh, and these students and support teachers and educators and paraprofessionals and all support staff. Um, I came here not knowing that I was an educator. But thanks to all of you, I have learned that I am, and, and just also the opportunity to support African American students. I, I appreciate this board for allowing me to have that opportunity and Aria allowing me to work. But that and with our departed Tracy Bowden, she uh, she showed me the way. Um, so uh, I am I'm 100% confident in what what is in store for this organization. Uh, 29 to 71. Me and this guy always arguing about what's the number going to be on ADA. We made it happen with Cindy telling me, don't touch students. You know, <laughs> don't break up fights because you're gonna get in trouble. So, so, so I, I followed her rule except for once. I did break up one fight. But I, I survived. Campus security, they came and they, they helped me out. Um, what you guys uh, will know is this year is almost over. Four more days we are going to land safely as always. Um, uh, we went, went over the budget and the LCAP at the last board meeting, so you guys have all the details, but I just want to summarize. Um, what will happen from this year's close to next year's budget. Um, in short, revenue increased by $5 million based on the new governor's revised um, with uh, some adjustments for COLA, some one-time money. Um, but then um, we also built in $3 million of uh, cost on the labor side with benefits because of uh, negotiated increases with UTLA, with CEU, and, um, and the Teamsters. Um, Teamsters collective bargaining units, um, in addition to adding some staff in order to prepare for uh, next year with uh, counseling, grade level academies, and things like that. Um, and then we had an additional million dollars in operational costs, uh, but that leaves us about a million dollars um, to contribute to other investments that um, will be determined uh, by probably the first or second interim by Harvey and the, the new uh, leadership team. So uh, we are in good shape of that. Uh, uh, that that is just on the general fund side. In terms of CARES Act money, um, last year we spent four million dollars. This year we're going to spend eight million because we have eight million of qualifying expenses that we can afford. Um, that is money in, money out um, to continue to support the return of instruction. Um, to uh, some of the time that we have for teachers to do planning and make all the adjustments that are happening. Um, you know, we, we're going to book the uh, academy period of incentive to that. Um, so, you know, it, it is good to know that from where we came from, or at least my, my 10 years here, that this board has led, um, and the management team and the teachers and everybody here, we, we really moved Birmingham uh, quite a way, quite a way, um, before LCFM, so we were just trying to make, make, make them move. So we're a position. <laughs> Um, to do well, um, and um, I, I expect the gap between A through G to graduation to close within relatively quickly. Um, I am happy to say that I have like five students who are, they all who I was mentoring, they all went on to college and doing it. And, and I think my greatest lesson was one of the students didn't know, and that team in the college center, um, those counselors, they inspired students to say, "Hey, let's apply. Just just check it out." And this student, he wasn't going to. He came just like, I don't want to do this, Mr. Pepper. And he got into CSUN. He's like, oh my God, I didn't know that was possible. And that's what's being created. You know, so I see you know, we're going to be the best in the valley, the best in the city, the best in the state. So, thanks. Thank you for your dedicated service. My question, uh, and, and you maybe you can't answer, but. Matt referred to something. Where are we with the health benefit issue? So, you want to ask that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so I know we're in, our our lawyers are talking. So let's start with that. I, I think um, we have a system in place to try to address um, obstacles that will continue to come up and have continued to come up. And so we're committed to being there and doing whatever we need to do to facilitate with um, BRMS to make sure that our staff members are getting the service that they deserve. I, I think what I what I plan to bring to board um, uh, next year, and, and I'm glad you asked me that, so you can begin to think about it. I, I think we should reimburse all staff 
for the additional money that they have been contributing um, for uh, Anthem PPO, um, low and high. And so that's, uh, I'll have numbers for you next time. Um, we've looked at it, but I think um, it doesn't make sense that they've had to, they've been paying for sort of extra service um, and haven't been getting it, right? They haven't been getting the Anthem service that, that was expected. So, um, so for, for instance, um, if you're Anthem, low PPO, I don't know. We pay for that, so it would only be reimbursement for high. For high, okay. And so um, that, that's the big idea. I, I think we wanna make people whole on that. And, um, you know, we are in, in touch with other brokers and looking what our options are so we can transition to, um, to something that will be provide better service to our staff. And also in addition to the question about um, the testing, the on-site testing, um, what should be happening is um, the insurance, because of different insurance, the, when we test, the insurance will be um, asked to reimburse, but if they don't, that, those bills should be coming to Birmingham. And we already plan to cover that. So I will have the team look into what's going on on that side. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the challenge is that now that the funding for testing is gone, we bear the burden, we built that into the budget for next year. But um, depending on how testing plays out, I think we're going to definitely start the year off with that. Uh, it, it, it becomes like a $400,000 a week proposition that we're managing. So um, that will be, uh, you know, it's planned for us covering. That's why, you know, we're recognizing more money on the CARES side to cover that increment expenses as well. When does that uh, contract um, expire for the healthcare with the carrier now? So it, it, it's a calendar year, so um, benefits will uh, end in December, and we were going to do uh, December to December. Uh, January to December. January to January. 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 <coughs> Charge. May, may, I, may, I, may I real quick caution us that we're not agenda to talk about it, and I recommend yeah. that we keep it on the agenda going yeah. forward as not. It's a good idea. So just, just FYI, I mean, we're not. You know. No, the question was. Okay, just, just saying. Uh, I just want to just caution this. Okay. Do you have a question? I don't have a question. Okay. <laughs> but, let's, but let's keep it on the agenda as, as a standing yeah. guide to update the, the board on It's good idea. Okay, consent. Approval of credit card for May and the check register for May. It's in the Dropbox. Any additions or corrections to that one? I will agree to that. Okay. Second. We'll do all at once. It's consent. So, approval of May 24th regular board meeting minutes. Do we need a motion? No, it's consent. It's consent. So, that means just we'll agree once we get through it. And the third one is accept the uh, 2021. 22 LAUSD Charter Oversight Report. All right, we have consent. All right, let's move on to uh, action items. Let's do the, let's uh, take the first one out of order. Uh, Bob Marks. Uh, I'll just make a new motion. I would like to nominate five community members uh, to a new term of office and then to <coughs> July 1st, 2022. And those community members are Robert Alexander, Michael Bennett, George Lasseter, Antonio Pizano, and Marshall Ryman. Is there a second? I'll second. A second. A call for the vote. Uh, Bob Alexander. Yes. Marley's absent. Michael Bennett. Yes. Uh, Emily Hill is absent. Dennis Palmer is absent. Doris Dick. Um, Bob Marks. Yes. Matt Hardy is absent. Antonio. Yes. Marshall Robin. Yes. Karen Lowe. Yes. Um, John White. Yes. Virginia Witherow. Yes. And Jonathan's absent motion here. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, item number one. 
approval of the 2022-23 LCAP and supplemental uh, to the budget for 2021-22 CAP. Um, we've seen that in the last meeting. So yes, the motion is a motion to approve. Second. We move and second it. Any discussion? I don't know if we have to call the Yes. Yeah, call the roll everyone. Really? So yeah, because it's a, the LCAP is a county document. So. Well, yeah, but if, but if we're not in Zoom, well, you're in Zoom, Zoom, Zoom we did a roll call, but. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think, I think we're, we're in Bristol, we're fine. But yeah. Get out sure. yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Item number two, approval of the 2022-23 annual update of the local school welfare plan. Is there a motion? So Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Item number three, approval of the 2022-23 school plan for student achievements. The Con Act. No. Second. Move and second it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Carries. Item number four. Approval of charter safe renewal in the amount of $703,998. I can talk to that. Yes, please. So uh, <laughs> every year we have this our liability insurance and our workers comp. Um, just to give you some context. Uh, uh, Last year was actually six hundred thousand dollars, so there is a hundred thousand dollar increase. Uh, the uh, on the liability side, it was an eighty thousand dollar increase. A lot of that was driven by three major things: one, um, the inability or the challenge in uh, financing schools due to all the sexual misconduct activity that has happened over the years and the change in the legislation, where the look back period is much longer. Um, the other part is cybersecurity, since there has been an uptick in a lot of cybersecurity attacks, it's also, also hard to finance. And the last one is obviously special education is always a major um, thing uh, that has always been addressed. So that's the main driver. Um, on the workers' comp side, it's a $50,000 increase. Um, a, a lot of it's just based on utilization, so obviously workers' comp is always a moving target. Um, we had already budgeted. Um, about 680, we adjusted that with some, um, we, we kind of put a plug in to cover that, so it's already built into the budget that you guys to approve. Okay, is there a motion? No. So, second. second. All those in favor of approval of charge safe renewal, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Item number five, approval of three year AB 1505 complaint NWA assessment program for math and science. Cost of $135,300. I, I asked Isaac to just, just to share on um, what right. that is exactly. In your Dropbox, you have the contract. Um, they actually gave us a discount. They sent an updated one yesterday for $121,050. Um, we already have indeed, we're using NDB, NWA assessments in math and science. It's just we're trying to have a three year contract with them because we're going to be using them. Uh, to comply with AB 1505. I can give you permission to go on or thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of approval of the three year AB 1505 uh, contract, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Carries. Item number six approval of additional certificate staff, uh, certificate and staff. Independent Study Program Coordinator. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Carries. <laughs> Item number seven. <laughs> Approval of conversion of senior financial budget analyst position to fiscal management. So moved. You moved? Second. Any second? Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. Approval of salary schedule for fiscal manager position. No. From Dropbox. Second. Moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. 
All right. Uh, number nine, approval of fiscal year 23 budget. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of approve the budget, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Number 10, approval of 2022-23 board meeting calendar. That's a revision of the last calendar that we saw some problems. Um, it continues our policy of Saturdays and Tuesdays, alternating from 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to 4.30 on Tuesdays. Uh, it's in front of you, any discussion? Everybody happy with the calendar? Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Number 11, approval of the 2022 certificated work calendar. It's in front box. Somebody want to talk about that? I mean, the, the um, so same amount, same amount of um, uh, work days as we had before. There are additional um, unassigned days. Um, but uh, that, you know, it certificated, actually both certificated and classified work calendars were based on the instructional calendar that was already approved by board for 22-23. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the uh, certificated work calendar? So moved. Second. second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those moved. Carried. Number 12, approval of the 2022-23 classified work calendar. Anything? Move and second it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Number 13, approval of revision of student athlete vaccination policy. So you guys saw that. That was informational. Um, it was either last month or the month before that. Um, no change. It's just alignment to um, LAUSD in the state. Any discussion? Yes, Can I just no? offer a compliment? I saw something that you posted that had the percentages of all of the students by team that were vaccinated. Congratulations. It's a great job. Okay. Any discussion? Is there a motion? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Carries. 14. Approval of administrative director contracts for school years 2022-23. Mr. Bennett? So um, it's the same salary schedule as had already been, you know, that's already in place. And uh, uh, it's for the, the um, we read contracts for them two years ago. Two years are up. And so this is just another two-year contract for all of the um, administrators, the one that's not two years, the CBO, the CBO is three years. Move, second. second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Item number 15. As the next item, next agenda item regarding approval of one-time salary payment to the CEO principal, I am required by law to note the following prior to any board vote. The board will next be voted to approve a one-time salary payment to the CEO principal in the amount of $9,000 and all other items and conditions of employment as specified in the CEO principal's current employment contract July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024, executed on June, July 24th, 2021, remain the same. I would also note the above reference one-time payment is wholly in keeping with the compensation comparability study adopted by the board when approved the current employment agreements in July 2021. Is there a motion to approve? Second. 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 Move and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Thank you. And there's no closed session items. Adjourn. Hey, a motion to adjourn. Is there for a second? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See you in July. Bye. 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 Bye.